Hey everyone, Pat Beliveau here. It's Sunday the 26th of April, 2020. Um, just uh, got another, let's call it a gig story, sort of, to share with you. Um, this one involves two great alto saxophonists. One is um, a fellow by the name of George Robert, looks like George Robert, um, who was a former teacher of mine and a great friend um, who passed away a few years back due to leukemia. Um, and his one of his former teachers and mentors, Phil Woods, who I'm sure you're the jazzers here that are seeing this are familiar with Phil's work. If not, and you're into jazz saxophone, you really should check Phil out. He's, uh, he's quite something. So left a great uh, handful of wonderful music to listen to, as did George too. So um, anyway, I'll just, uh, I'll just start on the story and, and set the stage here. And I'll talk about George and Phil a little bit. Um, as we go or afterwards or something like that. So anyway, here's the actual story itself. Alto saxophonist Phil Woods came up to Calgary a couple of times, once with his own group and once as a guest with the primetime Big Ben. My contact person for being able to get him up here was my dear departed friend and teacher, Swiss alto saxophonist George Robert, one of the sweetest human beings you could ever meet, very true, and a world-class musician, also very true. If I'm not mistaken, both times he was here, that's Phil. We ended up at what was my favorite Italian restaurant here in town called De Guido. It no longer exists, unfortunately. Yeah, I, Italian food and I have gotten along very well, and we continue to do so, by the way. So anyway, uh, I had a very cool job, the very cool job of being Phil and George's driver for wherever they needed to go. So after we had arrived at the restaurant, they were still getting our table ready as we had a fairly large group coming in. There was a bench inside the entrance by the bar that I sat down on, and soon it was just me and Phil sitting there. He had already started the night with some champagne while we were waiting, so he and I started talking about a few different things. I remember him asking me about my background and where I learned to play sax, etc. And with him being old school, when it came to learning jazz, I told him I did go to university, but it wasn't one of the big jazz schools, at which point he leaned in looked me in the eye, and just to let you know, there's a couple expletives in this story, so I should have warned you beforehand. This is one of them. So basically, I was sitting there, and I said to him that I, I went to university, but uh, I didn't go one of the big to one of the big jazz schools. And he basically did, good, I hate that shit. And I'm like, okay. Okay, so um, then I realized how much love he had for jazz and academia. Yeah, smiley face. I don't remember how it came up in conversation, but I remember him saying how much he didn't like the fact that his solo on Billy Joel's Just The Way You Are was one of the things that he was most known for. One of the other solos I know he was on was, um, this is in the 70s, he played alto, the alto solo on Steely Dan's Dr. Wu from the Katie Lied album. And there was another one he played, it was one of Paul Simon's... Um, albums 1975 or so and i can't remember exactly what the album was or what the track was but anyway and then um also billy joel's just the way you are um he didn't like the fact that his solo on billy joel's just the way you are was one of the things he was most known for i told him that solo was iconic in the rock and pop genre so i could understand why i didn't say this to him but i believe that three of the most iconic rock pop tracks with prominent alto sax are, and in no particular order, Raphael Ravenscroft playing the sax line for Jerry Rafferty's Baker Street. I'm sure you all have heard that before. Oh, and this one, which is basically in the holy crap, it's overplayed category, Steve Gregory playing George Michael's Careless Whispers, and Phil Phil's playing on Billy Joel's Just the Way You Are. Phil told me about the session for Just the Way You Are. He showed up at the studio in New York City. Billy Joel wasn't there, but the producer was, and he was leading things along. Phil got his horn out, warmed up a bit. They played the bed track for him to hear and to let him know what they wanted him to do and where. After all of that, the engineer comes over the talkback mic and says, Okay, Phil, shall we try a take? To which Phil says, Sure. 
He plays the ensemble parts through, gets to the solo section, lays down the version we all know as the solo that uh, is in uh, Just the Way You Are Now, and finishes up by soloing on the fade-out at the end. After finishing, the engineer turns on the talkback mic and the producer says, Great take, Phil. You ready to do another? To which Phil replies, No, man, I'm good. You wanted Phil Woods? Well, you got him. He then packed up his horn and left the studio. While sitting on the bench at the restaurant, something happened I will not forget, ever. And another expletive coming up, by the way. At risk of this sounding like a pat on the back, which is not what it was meant to be. It's just one of the things I remember from the night. Or something that isn't... That isn't my intention. And it is just something that I will always remember about that evening. As Phil and I were talking, a fellow friend and bandmate, Derek Stoll, who plays piano with the big band and who has done and continues to do much work with me, came up to us and said hello to Phil. And then they began to talk a bit about the concert that we did. And then Derek asks Phil, so what do you think of this guy? And points to me. And Phil says, he plays like a motherfucker and smiles at me. In my head, I was like, hey, what? I know that I thanked him very much for saying so, but then I think I just sat there for about 30 seconds or so processing that while he and Derek continued talking. And quite honestly, probably when I said that, you were thinking, what? And I was, believe me, that thought went through my head too. Like, what? You, you said that? That was, um, yeah, I, I didn't see that coming, but wow, that's, uh, that was pretty freaking cool. Anyway, um, the night went on with much food and drink being consumed and many stories being shared. And at one point, Phil became very emotional when talking about how much this music needs to be preserved and to have a future in this world. I remember the table went silent when that happened. It was pretty cool to be there to hear him speak so passionately about that. And I remember, like, he was, um, he started with champagne at the beginning of the night talking with me on the bench, and I, and, you know, the, the food and drink were flowing, and I know by that time that we started talking about, you know, the, the music and, and where he started to get quite emotional, he was, um, he's def, he was definitely a handful of drinks in, so I know he probably had, uh, less of a filter at the time, but, but also, too, it was a chance for him to kind of really let his his voice out and his emotions be heard. And he really became, you know, quite emotional and, and uh, teary-eyed and stuff. And you could tell the passion behind what he does and, and how he felt about the music, which was, that was a, a really cool moment to be part of. Talking about... Um, him playing in New York across the street from another club where Charlie Parker was playing and, and going over and, and uh, hanging out with him a little bit and um, Parker playing his horn and Phil was all pissed off about how his horn was so sounding and he didn't like the sound of the horn and the mouthpiece and all that stuff and blah 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 and Parker picked up the horn and sounded like a million bucks and <laughs> Phil said that's the last time I'll worry about my horn or my neck strap or mouthpiece of reed or whatever you know, somebody like that can just pick up the horn and sound like a million bucks. And then here I am bitching about how much I don't like the way my horn sounds. So anyway, it was, it was quite a moment and, and, um, yeah, it's something I'll remember till the day I die. I know it. So anyway, uh, at the end of the night, Phil and George piled into the backseat of my car. Phil completely piss drunk. At one point at a red light, I looked in the rear view mirror at them while Phil was saying, oh shit. I still need to phone my wife, and she is going to be so pissed at me when I call her from the road, and I'm shit-faced yet again. And there was George sitting next to him, laughing so hard that I could see his face turning red and his eyes tearing up. It was a beautiful and funny thing. So, yeah, it was, um, it was quite something. <laughs> anyway, and those, those of you who may be watching this video that were there, because I know there's a whole bunch of Calgary people that were there, will probably remember that night just as vividly as I do. Uh, where George is concerned, uh, George was a former teacher of mine, student of Phil's, and of Bob Mincer as well when he attended the Manhattan School of Music. George was originally from Geneva area of Switzerland and um, moved to New York and lived there and then um, met a wonderful lady, Joan, um, who was from Vancouver. Um, living in Vancouver, and George ended up um, relocating, getting married and relocating to Vancouver. Um, 
I first met George, and I remember this because I had a a poster from the gig. There was a club on 11th Avenue Southwest called Sparky's, and George came through town with trumpeter Tom Harrell, and myself and Greg Bush, who I've made mention of in a previous video, uh, one of my main mentors here, uh, who teaches out in Nanaimo, BC now on Vancouver Island at Vancouver Island University, we went to go see uh, the quintet. So George and Tom Harrell, um, Reggie Johnson on bass, Dado Maroney on piano, and I think Peter Schmidlin on drums. Um, not 100% sure. This was 1988, so I can barely remember what I did yesterday. So, <laughs> so what does that tell you, right? Anyway, so 1988, I would have been 21 at the time. So we're listening to them play, and constantly, Greg is tapping me on the shoulder or giving me an elbow saying, you need to ask this guy for a lesson. And I'm like, no, 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 man. You, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm, that's, he won't have time for me. So then some time would go by, and again, I'd get an elbow in the ribs or a tap and say, man, you got to ask this guy for a lesson. I'm like, no, put the lesson thing to bed. I'm not going to do that. So I think probably two or three or four or 10 or 20 or 50 more times Greg kept bugging me to get a lesson with George. So I said, okay, I'll get a lesson with George. Yes, that would be great if I could. And, and as long as you stop bugging me, I'll go ask him for a lesson. So funny enough, I went up to George thinking, nah, he's going to turn me down. He's not going to have time for me. And he basically said, yeah, um, I am taking a bus to Edmonton tomorrow, but it was in mid afternoon. So I could do a lesson maybe late morning or something. And I was like, what? Okay, sure. So George and I, I ended up picking him up at the hotel and I took George over to Greg's house. This is when Greg lived here. And I did a lesson in Greg's practice room. Um, and George and I maintained contact ever since and became really good friends. And he introduced me to Phil. I was playing the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland in the summer of 89. I would have been 22. And I remember George came with Joan, his future wife-to-be at the time, and Phil, and came into the patio area where we were playing. Luckily for us, we were just finishing to take a set break, because I was playing alto. And Phil Woods walks in, and of course, you know, the fear of God is in you at that point, and you're like, yeah, I think I'll just throw my horn in the lake, you know, since Phil, Wood is here, Phil Woods is here. Luckily, we stopped. And I remember uh, George came up to the to the bandstand and said to Greg and I and all the guys in the band, he said, do you want to come and meet Phil Woods? I'm like, yeah, you think? So um, I wanted to get his autograph, but I had nothing for him to sign. I had no paper or anything like that. So I grabbed an original chart that we were playing of mine that I had written, and I took the piece of paper up to him with a felt marker. And I said, you know, he introduced himself and, and, you know, this was the first, very first time I met him. And I said, Mr. Woods, I really, really would like to get your autograph. But the only thing I have is this. It's a, it's a, my part for a song that I wrote for the group. He says, that's fine. Give me that. And he took the marker. And I remember, um, what he wrote at the bottom. It said to Pat, when in doubt, chromatics, Phil Woods. I should have framed that. And, uh, I'm not even sure if I know where that is now, which is a shame. But um, that was pretty cool. And then this other story with him coming up to Calgary and, and, um, and playing, being a soloist with the big band and, and having dinner with us and stuff. It was, it was pretty cool. To have a chance to play with him, to meet him, to hang out with him, to talk to him like that, you know, and talk about a piece of jazz history. Man, I, I was so lucky that night to be able to be there and so lucky to be involved in all of it. It was, I thank my lucky stars that I have been given experiences like that. It's, uh, I've experienced things that not a lot of people have, I know. And I am forever thankful to have rubbed shoulders with people like that. It's been quite the ride. And I hope it doesn't end anytime soon. But anyway, that's my Phil Woods, George Robert story. And George and I were great friends uh, from that point on. And I think it was three years ago he passed away. He was only 56, way too early. And from 1988 up until, well, three years ago, I guess, so 2017, 
we maintained contact. You know, we, we, we spoke a lot. We emailed, you know, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about him. He was a wonderful human being and just a mother player. So anyway, uh, that's all the news, weather and sports for this one. So again, I'm going to set up my, uh, my email address. You'll see it down below. If you have any, uh, thoughts, comments, questions, topic, uh, suggestions, I'm just going to keep going here, putting up videos. So anyway, thanks for joining. Thanks for joining in to hear this and thanks for stopping by and listen to me babble. Okay. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.